Chapter 21 Simply by putting his shoulder against her and shoving her aside, Dirk Courtney cleared a small girl from the doorway and was first down the steps and out into the sun. Without looking back at the schoolhouse, he headed for the hole in the back hedge, and the others would be following. They caught up with him while he was selecting a clay lut from the hedge. Hurry up, Dirk ordered. We've got to get to the river first, else they'll get the best place. They spread out along the hedge, small boys chattering like a troop of excited monkeys. Lend me your knife, Dirky. Hey, look at my lut. Nick Peterson brandished the short rod of Port Jackson willow he had cut and peeled. It whipped with a satisfying swish. It's not a lut, Dirk informed him. It's a Lee Metford. He looked around the rest of his team. You remember now, I'm Lord Kitchener, and you've got to call me my lord. And I'm General French, announced Nick. This was fair enough. After all, he was Dirk's chief lieutenant. It had taken Dirk a mere two weeks and five bloody fistfights to reach his position as unchallenged leader. And I'm General Methwin, one of the lesser members yelped. And I'm General Buller, and I'm General Gattaca. You can't all be generals. Dirk glared around. Only Nick and I are generals. You're all just privates and things. Oh, gee, man, Dirky, why are you always got to spoil things? You shut your mouth, Brian, Dirk sensed mutiny, and quickly he diverted their attention. Come on, let's go and get ammo. Dirk took the long route down the sanitary lane. This way he was unlikely to meet adults and have any of his force seconded to serve elsewhere at wood chopping or gardening under parental control. Peaches are nearly ripe, Nick commented as they passed the pie orchard. Another week, Dirk agreed, and crawled through the hedge into the Van Essen plantation that spread down to the baboonstrom. There they are, someone shouted as they emerged from the trees. Boers, General! Out on the right, busy along the bank of the river, was another bunch of small figures, sons of the Dutch families in the district. I'll go and talk to them, Dirk said. You go for ammo. They trotted off towards the river, and Dirk called after them. Hey, Nick, get me a good dollop of clay, hey? All right, my lord. With all the dignity of a general, officer, and a peer of the realm, Dirk approached the enemy and stopped a short distance from them. Hey, Pete, are you ready yet? he asked haughtily. Pete van Essen was his second cousin twice removed. A chunky lad, but not as tall as Dirk. Yeah. The same rules, Dirk asked. Yeah, the same rules. No clothes, Dirk warned him. And no throwing with stones, Pete shot back. How many you got? Dirk began counting the enemy suspiciously. Fifteen, same as you. All right, then, Dirk nodded. Okay, then. Nick was waiting for him below the bank. Dirk jumped down beside him and accepted the large ball of blue clay that Nick handed him. It's just right, Dirky, not too wet. Good, let's get ready. Quickly, Dirk stripped off his clothing, pulled the belt from the loops of his pants and buckled it around his waist to hold his spare lutz. Hide the clothes, Brian, Dirk ordered, and surveyed his naked warriors. Nearly all of them still retained the almost womanly shape of youth, undeveloped chests, protruding stomachs and fat white buttocks. They'll come down the river like they do every time, Dirk said. This time we're going to ambush them. As he spoke, he kneaded a handful of clay into a ball and spiked it onto the end of the lut. Me and Nick will wait here, the rest of you on top of the bank in those bushes back there. He was looking for a target to practice on, and he found it in a water tortoise, which was laboriously climbing the far bank. Watch that old skill putt, he interrupted himself, stepped forward with his right hand holding the lut thrown back, then whipped it through in an overhead swing. The ball of clay flew from the end of the rod with a vicious hum and smacked onto the shiny black carapace with a force that left a white star-shaped crack upon the shell. The tortoise jerked in his head and limbs and toppled backwards into the stream. Good shot, man. There he is. Let me have another shot. Now that's enough. You'll get plenty of shots just now. Dirk stopped them. Now listen to me. When they, when they come... Me and Nick will hold them here for a bit, then we'll run back along the river, and they'll chase us. Wait until they're right underneath you, then give it to them. Dirk and Nick crouched side by side, close in against the bank, with the water up to their noses. A tuft of reeds hid those parts of their heads still above the surface, 
and within easy reach their loaded clay luts lay on dry land. Below water, Dirk felt Nick's elbow nudge his ribs, and he nodded carefully. He also had heard the whisper of voices around the bend of the river, and the roll and plop of loose earth dislodged by a careless foot. He turned his head and answered Nick's grin, with one just as bloodthirsty, then peered around the reeds. Twenty paces in front of him, a head appeared cautiously around the angle of the bank, and the expression on its face was set and nervous, and Dirk moved his own head back behind the bunch of reeds. A long silence, broken suddenly. They're not here. The voice was squeaky with adolescence and tension. Booty was a delicate child, small for his age, who insisted on joining the rest of them in games beyond his strength. Another long silence and then the sound of a wholesale but stealthy approach. Dirk reached out and gripped Nick's arm. The enemy were committed, out in the open. He lifted his mouth above the surface. Now, he whispered, and they reached for their luts. The surprise was complete and devastating. As Dirk and Nick rose dripping with throwing arms cocked, the attackers were bunched in such a way that they could neither run nor return the fire unhampered. The clay pellets flew into them, slapping loudly on bare flesh, producing howls of anguish and milling, colliding confusion. "'Give it to them!' shouted Dirk, and threw again, without picking his man, blindly into the mass of legs and arms and pink backsides. Beside him, Nick worked in a silent frenzy of load and throw. The confusion lasted perhaps fifteen seconds, before the howls of pain became shouts of anger. "'It's only Dirk and Nick!' Get them! It's only two of them! The first pellet flipped Dirk's ear. The second hit him full in the chest. Run! he gasped through the pain, and floundered to the bank. Bent forward to climb from the stream, he was frighteningly vulnerable, and a pellet thrown at point-blank range took him in that portion of his anatomy which he was offering to the enemy. The sting of it propelled him from the water and clouded his vision with tears. Chase them! Hit them! The pack bayed after them. Pellets hissed about them and slapped at them as they pelted back along the stream. Before they reached the next bend, their backs and bottoms were dappled with the angry red spots, which tomorrow would be bruises. Without discretion, hot with the chase, shouting and laughing, the attackers poured into the trap, and as they rounded the bend, it closed upon them. Dirk and Nick stood poised to meet them, and suddenly the bank above their heads was lined with squealing, dancing, naked savages, who hurled a steady stream of missiles into them. For a minute they stood it. Then, completely broken, they scrambled out of the riverbed with pellets flailing them and raced panic-stricken for the shelter of the plantation. One of them remained below the bank, kneeling in the mud, sobbing softly. But according to the unspoken laws that governed them, this one was exempt from further punishment. "'It's only Booty!' Nicky shouted. "'Leave him! Come on! Chase the others!' and he scrambled up the bank and led them after the flight. Yelling and shrilling with excitement, they streamed away through the brown grass to where Piet van Essen was desperately trying to stay the route on the edge of the plantation and gather his men to meet the charge. But another of them remained below the bank, Dirk Courtney. There were just two of them now, screened by the bank, completely alone. Booty looked up and through his tears saw Dirk coming slowly towards him. He saw the lut in Dirk's hand, and the expression on his face. He knew he was alone with Dirk. "'Please, Dirk,' he whispered. "'I give up! Please, I give up!' Dirk grinned. Deliberately he moulded the clay pellet onto his lut. "'I'll give you all my lunch tomorrow,' pleaded Booty. "'Not just the sweets, I'll give you all of it!' Dirk hurled the clay. Booty's shriek thrilled his whole body. He began to tremble with the pleasure of it. I'll give you my new pocket knife. Booty's voice was muffled by sobs and his arms which he had crossed over his face. Dirk loaded the lut, slowly, so he could savour this feeling of power. Please, Dirky, please, man, I'll give you anything you... And Booty shrieked again. Take your hands off your face, Booty. Dirk's voice was strangled, thick with pleasure. No, Dirky, please, no! Take your hands away and I'll stop. Promise, Dirky, you promise you'll stop. I promise, 
whispered Dirk. Slowly, Butty lowered his arms. They were thin and very white, for he always wore long sleeves against the sun. You promised, didn't you? I did what you... And the clay lut hit him across the bridge of his nose, spread as it struck, jerking his head back. Immediately there was blood from both nostrils. Butty clawed at his face, smearing blood onto his cheeks. You promised, he whimpered. You promised. But Dirk was already moulding the next pellet. Dirky walked home alone. He walked slowly, smiling a little, with soft hair falling forward onto his forehead and a smear of blue clay on one cheek. Mary was waiting for him in the kitchen of the cottage on Proteus Street. She watched from the window while he slipped through the hedge and crossed the yard. As he came towards the door, she noticed the smile on his face. There was hardly sufficient room in her chest for what she felt as she looked at the innocent beauty of his face. She opened the door for him. "'Hello, darling. Hello, Mary,' Dirk greeted her, and his little smile became a thing of such radiance that Mary had to reach for him. "'My goodness, you're covered in mud. Let's get you bath before your grandma gets home.' Dirk extricated himself from her embrace and moved in on the biscuit tin. I'm hungry. Just one, Mary agreed, and Dirk took a handful. Then I've got a surprise for you. What is it? Dirk was more interested in the biscuits. Mary had a surprise for him every evening, and usually it was something silly, like a new pair of socks she had knitted. I'll tell you when you're in the bath. Oh, all right, still munching, Dirk set off for the bathroom. He began to disrobe along the passage, dropping first his shirt and then his pants for Mary to retrieve as she followed. What's the surprise? Oh, Dirk, you've been playing that horrible game again. Mary knelt beside the tub and gently passed the soapy flannel down his bruised back and buttocks. Please promise me you'll never play it again. All right. It was a very simple matter to extract a promise from Dirk. He had made this particular one before. Now, what's your surprise? Guess, Mary was smiling now, a secret knowing smile which immediately caught Dirk's attention. He studied her scarred face, her ugly loving face. Sweets, he hazarded, and she shook her head and caressed his naked body with the flannel. Not socks. No. She dropped the flannel into the soap-scummed water and clasped him to her chest. No, not socks, she whispered. He knew then. Is it? Is it? Yes, Durkey, it's about your father. Instantly he began to struggle. Where is he, Mary? Where is he? Into your nightshirt first. Is he here? Has he come home? No, Dirk. He isn't here yet. He's in Peter Maritzburg. But you're going to see him soon, very soon. Grandma has gone now to make reservations on the train. You're going to see him tomorrow. His hot, wet body began to tremble in her arms, quivering with excitement. Chapter 22 In some respects, Mrs. Courtney, it was possibly all to the good that we were unable to contact you before. The Surgeon Major tamped tobacco into his pipe and began methodically searching all his pockets. Your matches are on the desk, Ada came to his assistance. Oh, thank you. He got the pipe drawing and continued. You see, your son was attached to an irregular unit. There was no record of next of kin. And when he came to us from Colenso six weeks ago, he was, shall we say, in no condition to inform us of your address. Can we see Pa now? Dirk could no longer contain himself. For the past five minutes he had wriggled and fidgeted on the couch beside Ada. You'll see your father in a few minutes, young man. And the surgeon turned back to Ada. As it so happens, Mrs. Courtney, you have been spared a great deal of anxiety. At first there were grave doubts that we would be able to save your son's life, let alone his right leg. Four weeks it hung in the balance, so to speak. But now, and he beamed at Ada with justifiable pride, well, you'll see for yourself. He's well? Quickly, anxiously, she asked. What a formidable constitution your son has, all muscle and determination. He nodded, still smiling. Yes, he's well on the road to recovery. There may be a slight limp in the right leg, but um, when you weigh that against what might have been... He spread his hands eloquently. 
Now, the sister will take you through to him. When can he come home? Ada asked from the doorway. Soon. Another month, perhaps. A deep veranda, cool with shade and the breeze that came in across the hospital lawns. A hundred high metal beds along the wall, a hundred men in grey flannel nightshirts, propped against white pillows. Some of them slept. A few were reading. Others talked quietly or played chess and cards on boards set between the beds. But one lay withdrawn, staring at, but not seeing, the pair of fiscal shrikes which squabbled raucously over a frog on the lawn. The beard was gone, removed while he was too weak to protest on the orders of the ward sister, who considered it unhygienic, and the result was a definite improvement that even Sean secretly admitted. Shielded for so long, the skin on the lower half of his face was smooth and white like that of a boy. Fifteen years had been shaved away with that coarse black mat. Now emphasis was placed on the heavy brows, which, in turn, directed attention to his eyes, dark blue, like cloud shadow on mountain lakes. Darker blue at this moment, as he considered the contents of the letter he held in his right hand. The letter from Saul was three weeks old, and already the cheap paper was splitting along the creases from constant refolding. It was a long letter, much of it devoted to detailed description of the clumsy sparring along the Tugela River, in which Buller's army was now engaged. There was one reference to the headaches from which the writer periodically suffered as a result of his wound, which was now externally healed, and many more to the deep gratitude that Saul felt for him. These embarrassed Sean so much that when re-reading the letter he scowled and skipped each one as he came to it. But there was one paragraph to which Sean returned each time, and read slowly, whispering it to himself, so that he could savour each word. I remember telling you about Ruth, my wife. As you know, she escaped from Pretoria, and is in Peter Maritzburg, staying with relatives of hers. Yesterday I had a letter from her that contained the most wonderful tidings. We have been married four years this coming June, and now at last, as a result of our brief meeting when she arrived in Natal, I am to become a father. Ruth tells me she has determined on a daughter, though I am certain it will be a son. And she has selected a name. It is a most unusual name. To be charitable, I can see that it will require a great deal of diplomacy on my part to make her change her mind. Among her many virtues is an obstinacy reminiscent of the Rock of Ages. She wants to name the poor waif Storm. Storm Friedman, and the prospect appalls me. Although our faiths differ, I have written to Ruth, asking her to agree to your election as Sandek, which is the equivalent of Godfather. I can foresee no objection from Ruth, especially in view of the debt which we both owe you, and it needs now only your consent. Will you give it? At the same time, I have explained to Ruth your present situation and address, care of Gray's Hospital, Peter Maritzburg, and asked her to visit you there so that she can thank you personally. I warn you in advance that she knows as much about you as I do. I am not one to hide my enthusiasms. Lying with the letter clutched in his hand, Sean stared out across the lawns into the sunlight. Beneath the bedclothes, swelling up like a pregnant belly, was the wicker basket that cradled his leg. Storm, he whispered, remembering the lightning playing blue and blinding white upon her body. Why doesn't she come? Three weeks he had waited for her. She knows that I am here. Why doesn't she come to me? Visitors for you? The sister paused beside him and straightened the bedclothes. Oh, he struggled up onto his good elbow, with the other arm still in its sling across his chest. A lady, and he felt it surge through him. And a small boy. The cold backwash of disappointment, as he realised it was not her. Then immediately guilt. Ada and Dirk. How could he hope it was someone else? Without the beard, Dirk did not recognise him until he was ten paces away. Then he charged. His cap flew from his head, and his dark hair, despite the bonds of brilliantine, sprang up into curls as he ran. He was squeaking incoherently as he reached the bed, clambered up onto Sean's chest to lock both arms around his neck. It was some time before Sean could prise him loose and look at him. "'Well, boy,' he said, and then again, "'Well, my boy!' Unable to trust himself not to lay his love for the child bare for all to see. There were a hundred men watching and grinning. Sean sought diversion by turning to Ada. She waited quietly, 
as she had spent half her lifetime waiting. But when he looked at her, the tenderness showed in her smile. Sean, she stooped to kiss him. What happened to your beard? You look so young. They stayed for an hour, most of which was taken up by a monologue from Dirk. In the intervals while he regained his breath, Ada and Sean were able to exchange all their accumulated news. Finally, Ada stood up from the chair beside Sean's bed. The train leaves in half an hour and Dirk has school tomorrow. We'll come up from Ladyburg each weekend until you're ready to return home. Getting Dirk out of the hospital was like evicting an unruly drunk from a bar. Alone, Ada could not manage it, and she enlisted a male hospital orderly to the cause. Kicking and struggling in tantrum, Dirk was carried down the veranda with his screams ringing back to Sean long after he had disappeared from view. I want my dad! I want to stay with my dad! Chapter 23 Benjamin Goldberg was the executor of his brother's estate. This estate consisted of a 40% shareholding in Goldberg Brothers Limited, a company which listed among its assets a brewery, four small hotels and a very large one, situated on the Marine Parade at Durban, 16 butcher shops and a factory devoted to the manufacture of polony, pork sausages, bacon and smoked ham. The last products caused Benjamin some embarrassment but their manufacture was too profitable to be discontinued. Benjamin was also the chairman of the board of Goldberg Brothers and a 60% shareholder. The presence of an army of 25,000 hungry and thirsty men in Natal had increased the consumption of beer and bacon in a manner that caused Benjamin further embarrassment, for he was a peaceable man. The huge profits forced upon him by the hostilities both troubled and delighted him. These same two emotions were evoked by the presence in his household of his niece. Benjamin had four sons, and not a single daughter. His brother Aaron had left one daughter, for whom Benjamin would gladly have traded all four of his own sons. Not that the boys weren't doing very well, all of them settled into business very nicely. One of them running the Port Natal Hotel, the eldest managing the brewery, and the two others in the meat section. But... Ah, and here Benjamin sighed. But Ruth! There was a girl for a man's old age. He looked at her across the polished stinkwood breakfast table, with its encrustation of silver and exquisite bone china, and he sighed again. Now, Uncle Ben, don't start again, please, Ruth buttered her toast firmly. So all I'm saying is that we need him here. Is that so bad? Saul is a lawyer. No, is that so bad? He's a lawyer, but we need a lawyer with us. The fees I pay out to those other schmocks. He doesn't want to come into the company. All right. We know he doesn't want charity. We know he doesn't want your money working for him. We know all about his pride. But now he's got responsibilities. Already he should be thinking about you and the baby, not so much about what he wants. At the mention of the baby, Ruth frowned slightly. Benjamin noticed it. There were few things he did not notice. Ah, young people, if only you could tell them. He sighed again. All right, we'll leave it until Saul comes back on leave, he agreed heavily. Ruth, who had never mentioned her uncle's offers of employment to Saul, had a momentary vision of living in Peter Maritzburg, close enough to be drowned in the tidal waves of affection that emanated from her uncle Benjamin, caught like a tiny insect in the suffocating web of family ties and duties. She flashed at him in horror. You ever mention it to Saul and I'll never speak to you again. Her cheeks flushed wondrously and fire burned in her eyes. Even the heavy braid of dark hair seemed to come alive like the tail of an angry lioness, flicking as she moved her head. Oi, 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 Benjamin hid his delight behind hooded lids. What the temper, what the woman. She could keep a man young forever. Ruth jumped up from the table. For the first time, he noticed that she wore a riding habit. Where are you going, Ruth? You're not riding again today. Yes, I am. But the baby! Uncle Ben, why did you never learn to mind your own business? And she marched out of the room. Her waist was not yet thickened with pregnancy, 
and she moved with a grace that played a wild discord on the old man's heartstrings. You should not let her treat you that way, Benjamin. Mildly, the way she did everything, his wife spoke from across the table. There's something troubling that girl. Carefully, Benjamin wiped egg from his moustache, laid the napkin on the table, consulted the gold fob watch he drew from his waistcoat, and stood up. Something big? You mark my words. It was Friday. Strange how Friday had become the pivot on which the whole week turned. Ruth urged the chestnut stallion, and he lengthened his stride under her, surging forward with such power that she had to check him a little and bring him down into an easy canter. She was early, and waited ten impatient minutes in the oak-lined lane behind Gray's hospital, before, like a conspirator, the little nurse slipped out through the hedge. Have you got it? Ruth demanded. The girl nodded glanced around quickly and took an envelope out of her grey nursing cloak. Ruth exchanged it for a gold sovereign. Clutching the coin, the nurse started back for the hedge. Wait! Ruth stopped her. This was her only physical contact, and she was reluctant to break it so soon. How is he? It's all there, ma'am. I know. But tell me how he looks. What he does and says, Ruth insisted. Oh, he's looking fine now. He's been up and about on his sticks all week, with that big black savage helping him. The first day he fell, and you should have heard him swear, Lordy. They both laughed together. He's a real card, that one. He and sister had another tiff yesterday when she wanted to wash him. He called her a shameless strumpet. She gave him what for, all right. But you could see she was ever so pleased, and she went around telling everybody about it. She burbled on, and Ruth listened enchanted until... Then, yesterday... You know what he did when I was changing his dressing? She blushed coyly. He gave me a pinch behind. Ruth felt a hot flood of anger wash over her. Suddenly she realised that the girl was pretty in an insipid fashion. And he said, thank you. Ruth had to restrain the hand that held her riding crop. I have to go now. Usually the long skirts of her habit hampered her in mounting, but this time she found herself in the saddle without effort. Next week, ma'am? Yes, and she hit the stallion across his shoulder. He lunged forward so violently that she had to clutch at the pommel of the saddle. She rode him as she had never ridden a horse before, driving him with whip and spur until dark patches of sweat showed on his flanks and froth spattered back along his shoulders, so that by the time she reached a secluded spot on the bank of the Amgheni River, far out of town, her jealousy had abated and she felt ashamed of herself. She loosened the stallion's girth and petted him a little, before leaving him tethered to one of the weeping willows, and picking her way down the bank to her favourite log on the water's edge. There she settled herself and opened the envelope. If only Sean could have known that his temperature chart, progress report, house doctor's recommendations, and the sucrose content of his urine were being so avidly studied, he would probably have added a ruptured spleen to his other ills. At last, Ruth folded the pages into their envelope and tucked it away in the jacket of her habit. He must look so different without his beard. She stared into the pool below her, and it seemed as though his face formed in the green water and looked back at her. She touched the surface with the toe of her riding boot, so that the ripples spread and shattered the image. She was left with only the feeling of loneliness. I must not go to him, she whispered stealing the resolve which had kept her from him these past weeks, since she had known he was there, so close, so terribly near. Determinedly she looked down again into the pool and tried to conjure up the face of her husband. All she saw was a yellow fish gliding quietly across the sandy bottom, with the pattern of its scales showing like the teeth of a file along its sides. She dropped a pebble into the water, and the fish darted away. Saul. Merry little Saul with his monkey face, who made her laugh the way a mother laughs at her child. I love him, she thought. And it was true, she loved him. But love has many shapes, and some are the shapes of mountains, tall and jagged and big, while others are the shape of clouds, which have no shape, no sharp outline. Soft they blow against the mountain and change and stream away. But the mountain stands untouched by them. 
The mountain stands forever. My mountain, she murmured. And she saw him again so vividly, standing tall above her in the storm. Storm, she whispered, and clasped her open hands across her belly that was still flat and hard. Storm, she whispered, and felt the warmth within her. It spread outwards from her womb, the heat rising with it, until it was a burning madness she could no longer control. With her skirts flying about her legs, she ran to the stallion, her hands trembled on the straps of the girth. Just once, she promised herself, just this once more. Desperately, she clawed up into the saddle. Just this once, I swear it. And then brokenly, I can't help myself. I've tried. Oh, God, how I've tried. An appreciative stirring and hum of comment from the beds along the wall followed her as she swept down the hospital veranda. There was urgent grace in the way she held her skirts gathered in one hand, in the crisp staccato tap of her pointed boots along the cement floor, and the veiled swing of her hips above. There was unrestrained eagerness in the sparkle in her eyes, and the forward thrust of her breasts beneath the wine-coloured jacket. The wild ride which brought her here had flushed her cheeks and tumbled her hair glossy black down her temple and onto her forehead. Those sick and lonely men reacted as though a goddess had passed them by, thrilled by her beauty, yet saddened because she was unattainable. She did not notice them. She did not feel their hungry eyes upon her, nor hear the aching whisper of their voices, for she had seen Sean. He came slowly across the lawns towards the veranda, using the stick awkwardly to balance the drag of his leg. His eyes were downcast, and he frowned in thought. Her breath caught in her throat as she saw how wasted was his body. She had not remembered him so tall, with shoulders gaunt and wide, like the cross-tree of a gallows. Never before had she seen the bony thrust of his jawline, nor the pale smoothness of his skin, faintly blue with new-shaved beard. But she remembered the eyes heavily overscored with black brows, and his great beaky nose above the wide sensuality of his mouth. On the edge of the lawn he stopped with feet apart, set the point of the cane between them, with both hands clasped over the head of it, and he lifted his eyes and looked at her. For many seconds neither of them moved. He stood balancing on the cane, with his shoulders hunched and his chin raised, as he stared at her. She in the shadow of the veranda, her skirts still held in one hand, but the other at her throat, fingers trying to still the emotions that fluttered there. Gradually his shoulders straightened until he stood tall. He hurled the cane aside and reached both hands open towards her. Suddenly she was running over the smooth green lawn, into his arms, trembling in silent intensity, while he held her. With both arms around his waist, and her face pressed against his chest, she could smell the man's smell of him, and feel the hard muscle of his arms as he enfolded her, and she knew she was safe. As long as she stayed like this, nothing, nobody, could touch her. Chapter 24 On the slope of the table-top mountain that crouches over the town of Peter Maritzburg, there is a glade among the wattle trees. It is a secret place where even the timid little blue buck come out to graze in daylight. On a still day you can hear very faintly the pop of the wagon whips on the road below, or further off the steam whistle of a train. But that is all that intrudes in this wild place. A butterfly crossed the glade in uncertain wobbling flight. It came out of the sunlight into the dappled moving shade along the edge and settled. That's good luck, Sean murmured lazily, and Ruth lifted her head from the plaid rug on which they lay. As the butterfly moved its wings, fanning them gently, the iridescent green and yellow markings sparkled in the speck of sunlight that pierced the roof of leaves above them and fell upon it like a spotlight. It tickles, she said, and the insect moved like a living jewel across the smooth white field of her belly. It reached her navel and paused. Then the tiny tendril of its tongue uncurled and dabbed at the fine sheen of moisture that their loving had left upon her skin. He's come to bless the baby. 
the butterfly skirted the deep, delicately chiselled pit and moved on downwards. Oh, don't you think he's being just a little forward? He doesn't have to bless that as well. He certainly seems to know his way around, Sean admitted dubiously. The butterfly found its road southwards blocked by a forest of dark curls, so laboriously it turned and retraced its steps towards the north. Once more it detoured round her navel and then headed unerringly for the pass between her breasts. Keep right on, friend, Sean cautioned. But it turned suddenly and climbed the steep slope until at last it sat triumphant on the peak. Sean watched it throbbing its wings, blazing in oriental splendour upon her nipple, and he felt himself stirred once more. Ruth, his voice was husky again. She rolled her head to look into his eyes. Go away, little butterfly, and she brushed it from her breast. Later, after they had slept a little, Ruth woke him, and they sat facing each other on the rug with the open hamper between them. While Sean uncorked the wine, she worked over the hamper with the dedication of a priestess preparing a sacrifice. He watched her split the bread rolls and fill them with salty yellow butter, then open the screw-topped jars of soused beans and pickled onions and beetroot. A heart of young lettuce rustled crisply as she plucked its leaves into a wooden bowl and poured dressing over them. Her hair, released from its braid, broke like a black wave over the marble of her shoulders, then rippled and swung with the small movements of her body. With the back of her hand she brushed it from her forehead, then looked up at him and smiled. Don't stare, it's bad manners. She took the glass he offered her and sipped the cool yellow wine, set it aside and went on to dismember the fat-breasted chicken. Pretending to ignore his eyes upon her body, she began to sing softly the love song she had sung on the night of the storm, and shyly her breasts peeped at him through the black curtain of her hair. She wiped her fingers carefully on a linen napkin, took up the wine glass again, and with elbows on her knees leaned forward slightly and returned his scrutiny with equal frankness. Eat, she said. And you? In a little while I want to watch you. Then he was hungry. You eat the way you make love, as though tomorrow you die. <laughs> well, I'm taking no chances. You're covered with scars, like an old tomcat who fights too much. And she leaned forward and touched his chest with one finger. What happened there? Leopard. And there? She touched his arm. Knife. And there? His wrist. Burst shotgun. She dropped her hand and caressed the fresh purple cicatrice that twined around his leg like some grotesque parasitic vine. This one I know, she whispered, and her eyes were sad as she touched it. Quickly, to change her mood, he spoke. Now it's my turn to ask the questions. He reached across and laid his open hand upon her stomach, where the first faint bulge pressed warmly into his palm. What happened there? he demanded, and she giggled before she replied. Burst shotgun? Or was it a cannon? When she had repacked the hamper, she knelt beside him. He lay flat on his back, with a long black cheroot between his teeth. Have you had sufficient? she asked. My God, yes. And he sighed happily. Well, I haven't. And she leaned over him, took the cheroot from his mouth, and flicked it into the brambles. With the first faint flush of evening in the sky, a small breeze came down from the mountain and rustled the leaves above them. The fine hairs upon her forearms came erect, each on its tiny pimple of goose flesh, and her nipples stood out dark and hard. You must not be late back to the hospital on the very first day they've let you out. She rolled away from him and reached for her clothing. Machen will have me hung, drawn and quartered. Sean agreed. They dressed quickly and she was remote from him, all the laughter gone from her voice, and her face cold and expressionless. He stood behind her to lace the whalebone corset. He hated to cage that lovely body, and was about to say so. Saul is coming tomorrow. A month's leave. Her voice was harsh. His hands stilled, and they stood without moving. It was the first time either of them had referred to Saul since that morning a month ago, when she had come to him at the hospital. 
Why didn't you tell me sooner? His voice also harsh. I didn't want to spoil today. She had not turned towards him, but stood staring out across the glade to the far hills beyond the town. We must decide what we're going to tell him. There is nothing to tell him, she answered flatly. But what are we going to do? Now his voice was ugly with mingled dread and guilt. Do, Sean? She turned slowly, and her face was still cold and expressionless. We are going to do nothing. Nothing at all. But you belong to me, he cried in protest. No, she answered. The child, it's mine. At his words, her eyes narrowed and the sweet line of her lips hardened in anger. No, damn you, it isn't. Not yours, although you sired it. She flamed at him. It was the first time she had unleashed her temper at him. It startled Sean. The child belongs to Saul, and I belong to Saul. We owe you nothing. He stared at her. You don't mean that. And the flames of her anger faded. Quickly, he tried to press his advantage. We'll go away together. Run away, you mean. Sneak away like a pair of thieves. What would we take with us, Sean? The happiness of a man who loves and trusts us both? That and our own guilt? You'd never forgive me, nor I you. Even now, when we talk of it, you cannot meet my eyes. Already you are beginning to hate me a little. No, no. And I would hate you, she whispered. Call for my horse, please. You don't love him? The agonised accusal was wrung from him, but it was as though he had not spoken. She went on dressing. He'll want to see you. Half of every letter he writes is about you. I've told him that I've visited you at the hospital. I'm going to tell him, Sean shouted. I'll tell him everything. No, you won't, she answered him calmly. You did not save him at Colenso to destroy him now. You would destroy him, and us. Please call for my horse. Sean whistled. And they stood together, not touching, not talking, not even looking at each other, until Mbijani emerged from the bush below the glade leading the horses. Sean lifted her into the saddle. When? he asked quietly. Perhaps never, she answered, and swung the horse away. She did not look back, so Sean never saw the tears that streamed down her face. The muffled drum of hooves drowned her sobs, and she held her back and her shoulders stiff so that he would not know. Chapter 25 the war council ended long after dark, and when his commandants had upsaddled and ridden away to their lagers among the hills, Jan Polis sat alone beside the fire. He was tired, as though his brain was the cold, flabby body of an octopus, and its tentacles spread out to every extremity of his body. He was lonely. Now at the head of five thousand men, he was alone as he had never been in the vast solitude of the open felt. Because of the loneliness and because of the companionship, she had given him these past twenty years, his thoughts turned to Henrietta, and he smiled in the darkness and felt the longing blunt the edge of his determination. I would like to go back to the farm, for a week only, just to see that they are all well. I would like to read to them from the book, and watch the faces of the children in the lamplight. I would like to sit with my sons on the stoop, and hear the voices of Henrietta and the girls as they work in the kitchen. I would like... Abruptly he stood up from beside the fire. Yeah, you would like this and you would like that. Go then. Give yourself leave of absence, as you have refused it to so many others. He clenched his jaw, biting into the stem of his pipe. Or else sit here and dream like an old woman while twenty-five thousand Englishmen pour across the river. He strode out of the lager, and the earth tilted upwards beneath his feet as he headed for the ridge. Tomorrow, he thought. Tomorrow. God has been merciful that they did not rush the ridge two days ago, when I had three hundred men to hold it. But now I have five thousand to their twenty-five, so let them come. Suddenly, as he reached the crest, the valley of the Tugela lay below him, soft with moonlight so that the river was a black gash in the land. He scowled as he saw the field of bivouac fires that straddled the drift at Trichat's farm. They have crossed. May God forgive me that I had to let them cross, but I could not meet and hold them with three hundred. Two days I have waited in agony for my columns to cover the twenty miles from Colenso. 
Two days while the cannon bogged down in the mud. Two days while I watched their cavalry and their foot soldiers and their wagons crossing the drift, and I could not stop them. Now they are ready. Tomorrow they will come up to us. This is where they will come, to try at any other place's madness, a stupidity far beyond any they have shown before. They cannot try the right, for to reach it they must march across our front. With little cover and the river fencing them, they would expose their flank to us at two thousand yards. No, they cannot try the right. Not even Buller will try the right. Slowly he turned his head and looked out to the left, where the tall peaks rose sheer out of the heights. The formation of the ground resembled the back of a gigantic fish. Jan Polis stood upon its head on the relatively smooth slope of Tabanyama. But on his left rose the dorsal fin of the fish. This was a series of peaks. Falkrantz, Brockfontein, Twin Peaks, Conical Hill, and the highest and most imposing of all, Spionkop. Once again he experienced the nagging prickle of doubt. Surely no man, not even Buller, would throw any army against that line of natural fortresses. It would be senseless as the sea hurling its surf at a line of granite cliffs. Yet the doubt remained. Perhaps Buller, that pedestrian and completely predictable man. Buller, who seemed eternally committed to the theory of frontal assault, perhaps this time he would know that the slopes of Tabanyama were too logical, the only point at which he could break through. Perhaps he would know that the whole of the Boer army waited for him there with all their guns. Perhaps he would guess that only twenty burghers guarded each of the peaks on the left flank, that Jan Polis had not dared to spray his line so thin and had risked everything on Tabanyama. Jan Polis sighed. Now it was past the time for doubt. He had made the choice, and tomorrow they would know. Tomorrow. Van Mora. Heavily he turned away and started down towards the lager. The moon was setting behind the black massif of Spion Kop, and its shadow hid the path. Loose rock rolled under his feet. Jan Polis stumbled and almost fell. Vistar! the challenge from an outcrop of granite beside the path. A friend! Jan Polis saw the man now. He leaned against the rock with a mauser held low across his hips. Tell me, what commando are you with? The Weinbergers, under Larue. So, do you know Larue? the sentry asked. Yes. What colour is his beard? Red. Red as the flames of hell. The sentry laughed. Tell Umpol from me I'll tie a knot in it the next time I see him. Best you shave before you try, he might do the same for you, Jan Polis warned him. Are you his friend? Uh -huh. And his kinsman too. And the hell with you then also, the sentry laughed again. Will you drink coffee with us? It was an ideal opportunity for Jan Polis to mingle with his men and gauge their temper for tomorrow. Donkey! He accepted the invitation. Hut! The sentry straightened up, and Jan Polis saw he was a big man, made taller by the homburg that he wore. Carl, is there any coffee left in the pot? He yelled into the darkness beyond the rocks, and was answered immediately. In the name of God, must you bellow? This is a battlefield, not a political meeting, man. The English are as loud. I've heard them all night. The English are fools. Must you be the same? For you, only for you. The sentry dropped his voice to a sepulchral whisper, and then roared again suddenly. But what about that damned coffee man? This one is not short of stomach, Jan Polis grinned to himself, as the man, still chuckling happily, placed an arm about his shoulder and led him to the screen fire among the rocks. Three burghers squatted about it with blankets draped over their shoulders. They were talking among themselves as the sentry and Jan Polis approached. Oh, the moon will be down in half an hour, one of them said. Yeah, I will not be happy to see it gone. If the English plan a night attack, then they will come in the dark of the moon. Who is with you? Karl asked as they came towards the fire. A friend, the sentry replied. From what commando? The Weinbachers, Jan Polis answered for himself. And Karl nodded and lifted the battered enamel coffee pot from the fire. So you are with Uempol, and what does he think of our chances for tomorrow? That of a man with one bullet left in thick catbush, with a lungshot buffalo coming down in full charge. And does it worry him? 
Only a madman knows no fear. Wumpole is afraid, but he tries not to show it, for fear spreads among men like the white sore throat diphtheria. Jan Polis replied as he accepted the mug of coffee and settled down against a rock out of the firelight, so they would not recognize his face nor the color of his beard. Show it or not, grunted the sentry as he filled his mug, but I reckon he'd give one of his eyeballs to be back on his farm at Weinberg, with his wife beside him in the double bed. Jan Polis felt the glow of anger in his belly, and his voice, as his reply was harsh. You think him a coward? I think I would rather stand on a hill a mile behind the fighting and send other men in to die, the sentry chuckled again, but there was a sardonic note in it. I have heard him swear that tomorrow he will be in the front, wherever the fight is fiercest, growled Jan Polis. Oh, he said so, did he? So that we fight more cheerfully. But when the Lee Metfords rip your belly open, how will you know where Umpol is? I have told you he is my kin. When you insult him, you insult me. Anger had closed Jan Polis's throat so that his voice was hoarse. Hut! the sentry stood up quickly. Let us settle it now. Be still, you fools, Carl spoke irritably. Save your anger for the English. And then more softly, all of us are restless, knowing what tomorrow will bring. Let your quarrel stand. He is right, Jan Polis agreed, still choked with anger. But when I meet you again... How will you know me? the sentry demanded. Here, Jan Polis jerked the wide-brimmed terai hat from his head and flung it at the man's feet. Wear that, and give me yours in exchange. Why? the sentry stood puzzled. Then if ever a man comes up to us and says, You're wearing my hat, he will be saying, Jan Polis Larue is a coward. The man grinned so that his teeth glittered in the firelight. Then he dropped his own black homburg into Jan Polis's lap and stooped to pick up the terai. In that instant, faintly on the wind, soft as the crackle of dried twigs, they heard the rifle fire. Mousers! shouted Carl, and he leapt to his feet, sending the coffee pot flying. On the left, moaned Jan Polis in anguish. Oh, God help us, they've tried the left! The chorus of rifle fire rose, swelling urgently and now blending with the crisp crackle of the Mausers, was the deep belling of the Lee Metfords. Spionkop! They are on Spionkop! And Jan Polis ran, hurling himself down the path towards the lager, with the black Homburg jammed down over his ears. Chapter 26 The mist lay heavily on the peak of Spionkop that morning, so that the dawn was a thing of liquid, pearly light, a soft, uncertain thing that swirled about them and condensed in tiny drops upon the metal of their rifles. Colonel John Aitchison was breakfasting on ham sandwiches spread thickly with gentlemen's relish. He sat on a boulder with his uniform cloak draped over his shoulders and chewed morosely. No sign of the jolly old boy yet, the captain beside him announced cheerfully. That trench is not deep enough, Aitchison glowered at the shallow ditch which had been scraped in the stony soil and which was now filled to capacity with men in all the various attitudes of relaxation. I know, sir. There's not much we can do about it. We're down to bedrock and it would need a wagon load of dynamite to sink another foot. The captain selected a sandwich and upended the relish bottle over it. Anyway, all the enemy fire will be from below and the parapets will cover that. Along the front edge of the trench, Clods of earth and loose rock had been piled to a height of two feet. Pathetic cover for two thousand men. "'Have you ever been on this mountain before?' Aitchison asked politely. "'No, sir, of course not. Well, what makes you so bloody certain how the land lies? You can't see a thing in this mist.' "'Well, so we are on the crest, and it is the highest,' but Aitchison interrupted him irritably. "'Where are those damned scouts? Haven't they come in yet?' He jumped up and with his cloak swirling about him, strode along the trench. You men, can't you get that parapet higher there? At his feet a few of them stirred and began half-heartedly piling stone. They were exhausted by the long night climb and the skirmish which had driven the Boer garrison from the mountain, and Aitchison heard them muttering sullenly behind him as he walked on. 
Ageson, out of the mist ahead of him loomed the figure of General Woodgate, followed closely by his staff. Sir, Ageson hurried to meet him. Are your men entrenched? As best they can. Good. What of the enemy? Have your scouts reported back yet? No, they are still out there in the mist. And Aitchison pointed into the smoky billows that limited the range of their vision to fifty feet. Well, we should be able to hold them until we're reinforced. Let me know the moment... A small commotion in the mist behind them. And Woodgate paused. Uh, what is it? My scouts, sir. Saul Friedman began delivering his report from a range of twenty feet. His face was working with excitement as he scurried out of the mist. False crest! We're on the false crest! The true summit is two hundred yards ahead and there's a rise of ground out on our right flank, like a little knoll all covered with aloes, that enfilades our whole position. There are boars everywhere. The whole bloody mountain is crawling with them. Good God, man, are you certain? Colonel Aitchison, snapped Woodgate. Turn your right flank to face the knoll. And as Aitchison strode away, he added under his breath, If you have time and he felt the agitated swirl of the mist as it swept away before the wind. Chapter 27 Young Polis stood beside his pony. The mist had dewed in his beard and set it to sparkle in red gold. Across both shoulders, heavy bandoliers of ammunition drooped, and the Mauser rifle seemed like a child's toy in his huge hairy hands. His jaw was thrust forward in thought as he reviewed his dispositions. All night he had flogged his pony from lager to lager. All night he had roared and bullied and driven men up the slopes of Spionkop. And now around him the mountain rustled and murmured with five thousand waiting burghers, and in an arc of a hundred and twenty degrees behind it stood his guns. From Greenhill in the northwest to the reverse slopes of the Twin Peaks in the east, his gunners crouched beside their Crusoes and their Nordenfelts, ready to range in upon the crest of Spionkop. All things are ready, and now I must earn the right to wear this hat. He grinned and settled the Homburg more firmly over his ears. Any, take my horse back to the lager. The boy led it away, and he started up the last slope towards the summit. The light strengthened as he climbed, and the burghers among the rocks recognised the flaming beacon of his beard. Goeiach, oom Paul, and kom saam om die rooinekke te skiet, they called. The two burghers ran down to meet him. Umpol, we have just been forward to Allo Knoll. There are no English on it. Are you sure? It seemed too generous a gift of fortune. Yeah, man, they are all on the back of the mountain. We heard them digging and talking there. What commando are you? Jan Polis demanded of the men massed around him in the mist. The Carolina commando, voices answered. Come, ordered Jan Polis. Come, all of you. We are going to Allo Knoll. They followed, skirting the summit with the brush, brush, brush of hundreds of feet through the grass, hurrying so that their breathing steamed in the moist air, until abruptly ahead of them humped the dark mound of Allo Knoll, and they swarmed over it and disappeared among the rocks and crevices like a column of ants returning to their nest. Lying on his belly, young Polis lit his pipe and tamped down on the glowing tobacco with a fire-calloused thumb sucked the smoke into his mouth and peered into the solid white curtain of mist. In the eerie silence that had fallen upon the mountain, his stomach rumbled loudly, and he remembered that he had not eaten since the previous noon. There was a stick of biltong in his coat pocket. A lion hunts best on an empty stomach, he thought, and drew again on his pipe. Here comes the wind, a voice whispered near him, and he heard the rising sibilance of it through the aloes above his head. The aloes stood tall as a man, multi-headed, green candelabra tipped in crimson and gold, nodding slightly in the morning wind. Ah, young Polis felt it stirring deep in his chest, that blend of fear and exhilaration that drowned his fatigue. Here it comes. He knocked out his pipe, stuffed it still hot into his pocket, and lifted his rifle from the rock in front of him. Dramatically, as though unveiling a monument, the wind stripped the mists away. Beneath a sky of cobalt blue, soft golden brown in the early sunshine, lay the rounded peak of Spionkop, a long, uneven scar of red earth five hundred yards long was slashed across it. 
Almachtig, Jan Polis gasped. Now we have them. Above the crude parapet of the trench, like birds on a fence rail, so close that he could see the chin straps and the button on each crown, the light khaki helmets contrasted clearly with the darker earth and grass. While beyond the trench, completely exposed from boots to helmet, standing in the open or moving leisurely forward with ammunition and water canteens, were hundreds of English soldiers. For long seconds the silence persisted, as though the burghers who stared over their rifles at this unbelievable target could not bring themselves to press the triggers on which their fingers rested. The English were just too close, too vulnerable. A universal reluctance held the Mausers silent. Shoot! roared Jan Polis. Skit, girl, skit! And his voice carried to the English behind the trenches. He saw all movement among them suddenly paralysed. White faces turned to stare in his direction, and he sighted carefully into the chest of one of them. The rifle jumped against his shoulder, and the man went down into the grass. That single shot broke the spell. Gunfire crackled in hysterical unison, and the freeze of khaki figures along the trench exploded into violent movement as the bullets thudded amongst them. At that range, most of Jan Polis's burghers could be trusted to knock down four running springbok with five shots. In the few seconds that it took the English to dive into the trench, at least fifty of them went down, dead or wounded, and lay sprawled against the red earth. Now there were only the helmets and heads above the parapet to shoot at, and these were never still. They ducked and weaved and wobbled as Woodgate's men fired and reloaded, and seventeen hundred Lee Metford rifles added their voices to the pandemonium. Then the first shell, lobbed from a field gun on the reverse slope of Conical Hill, shrieked over the heads of the burghers and burst in a leap of smoke and red dust fifty feet in front of the English trench. A lull while Jan Polis's heliograph team below the crest signalled the range correction to the battery. Then the next shell burst beyond the trench. Another lull, and the third fell full upon the trench. A human body was thrown high, legs and arms spinning like the spokes of a wagon wheel. When the dust cleared, there was a gap in the parapet and half a dozen men frantically trying to plug it with loose rock. Together all the Boer guns opened. The constant shriek of big shells was punctuated by the vicious whine of the quick-firing pom-poms. And once again a mist covered the peak, this time a thin, sluggish mist of dust and lyddite fume, which diluted the sunlight and clogged the nostrils and eyes and mouths of men for whom a long, long day had begun. Chapter 28 Lieutenant Colonel Garrick Courtney was damnably uncomfortable. It was hot in the sun. Sweat trickled down under his tunic and moistened his stump so that already it was chafed. His field glasses magnified the glare as he looked out across the Tugela River, to the great hump of the mountain four miles away. The glare aggravated the ache behind his eyes, which was a memorial to last night's drinking. Woodgate seems to be holding very well. His reinforcements should be up to him soon enough. Sir Redvers Buller appeared to be satisfied, and none of his staff had any comment to add. Stolidly they stood and stared through their glasses at the peak, which was now faintly blurred with the dust and smoke of battle. Garrick was puzzling once more the devious lines of authority which Buller had established for the attack on Spion Kop. Commanding the actual assault was General Woodgate, who was now holding very well on the peak. Yet Woodgate was responsible not to Buller, but to General Charles Warren, who had his headquarters beyond Trichardt's Drift, where the column had crossed. Warren was in turn responsible to Buller, who was well back behind the river, standing on a pleasant little hill called Mount Alice. Everyone on the staff was aware that Buller hated Warren. Garrick was certain that Warren had been given command of an operation which Buller considered very risky, so that in the event of it failing, Warren would be discredited and goaded into resigning. Of course, if he succeeded, Sir Redvers Buller was still supreme commander, and the credit would therefore accrue to him. It was a line of reasoning Garrick found easy to follow. In fact, had he been in Buller's position, he would have done exactly the same thing. This secret knowledge gave Garry a deal of satisfaction, and standing beside Buller on the slope of Mount Alice, he felt very much in tune with him. He found himself hoping that Spion Kop would soon be a bloody slaughterhouse, and that Warren would retreat across the river in disgrace. He remembered the occasion in the mess, 
when Sir Charles had referred to him as an irregular and a damned colonial irregular at that. Gary's fingers tightened on his field glasses, and he glared out at the mountain. He was so deep in his resentment that he hardly noticed the signaller who came running from the mule wagon that housed the field telegraph which connected Buller's headquarters with those of Warren beyond the river. Sir! Sir, a message from General Warren! The urgency of the man's tone caught all their attentions. As one man, the entire general staff lowered their glasses and turned to him. Well, let's have it then, man. Buller snatched the sheet of notepaper and read it slowly. Then he looked up at Gary, and there was something in those pale, bulging eyes, a pleasure, a conspiratory gleam, that made Gary almost grin. Now, ah, what do you make of that, Courtney? He handed the sheet across and waited for Gary to read it. Message from Colonel Crofton on the Spion Cop. Reinforce at once or all is lost. General would get dead. What do you suggest, Warren? Seems to me, sir, Gary spoke slowly, trying to mask the fierce jubilation he felt, that Sir Charles Warren is on the verge of panic. Yes, that's the way it looks, Buller was openly gloating now. I would suggest sending him a message that will stiffen him, sir. Yes, I agree. Buller turned to the signaller and began to dictate. The mountain must be held at all costs. No withdrawal, I repeat, no withdrawal. Reinforce with Middlesex and Dorset regiments. Then he hesitated and looked across and around his staff. What do you know of this fellow Crofton? Is he the right man to command on the peak? There were non-committal sounds of negation from them, until Acor, Buller's ADC, spoke up. Sir, there is one excellent man up there, um, Aitchison, Colonel John Aitchison. You remember his showing at Colenso? Buller nodded thoughtfully, and turning back to the signaller, he went on with his dictation. You must put some really good hard fighting man in command on the peak. Suggest you promote Aitchison to Major General. Chapter 29 in front of the trench, the grass was flattened by the repeated counter-attacks that had swept across it, stained by the blood of those who had dragged themselves back from the Boer positions along the crest, and littered with the twisted corpses of those who had not. Every few seconds a shell exploded along the British line, so there was a continual moving forest of bursts, and the shrapnel hissed like the flails of threshing giants. John Aitchison forced himself to his feet and climbed onto the parapet and shouted, Come on, lads! This time they'll not stop us! In the trench below him, the dead and the wounded lay upon each other two and three deep, all of them coated with a layer of red dust. The same red dust coated the faces that looked up at him as he shouted again, Bugler, sound the charge! Come on, lads, forward! Take the bayonet to them! The bugle started to sing, brassy and urgent. Aitchison hopped like a gaunt old stork from the parapet and flapped his sword. Behind him he heard laughter from a dozen throats. Not the laughter of ordinary men, but the chilling discord of insanity. Follow me, the lanks! Follow me! His voice rose to a shriek, and they scrambled from the trench behind him. Dusty spectres with bloodshot eyes, smeared with dust and their own sweat. Their laughter and their curses blended with the babbling of the wounded, outstripped it, and climbed into a chorus of wild cheers. Without form, spreading like spilled oil, the charge flowed out towards the crest, Four hundred men staggering through the dust storm of shellfire and the tempest of the Mausers. Aitchison stumbled over a corpse and fell. His ankle twisted with a shock of pain that jolted his dulled senses. He recovered his sword, dragged himself up, and limped grimly on towards the rampart of boulders that marked the crest. But this time they did not reach it, to be thrown back as they had before. This time the charge withered before it had covered half the distance. In vain, Aitchison waved them forward, yelling until his voice was a hoarse croak. They slowed and wavered. Then at last they broke and streamed back down the open, bullet-swept slope to the trench. Tears of frustrated anger streaking his dusty cheeks, Aitchison hobbled after them. He fell over the parapet and lay face down on the corpses that lined the trench. A hand shaking his shoulder roused him, and he sat up quickly and tried to control his breathing that shuddered up his throat. Dimly he recognised the man who crouched beside him. "'What is it, Friedman?' he gasped. But the reply was drowned in the arrival of another shell and the delirious shrieks of a man wounded in the belly in the trench beside them. "'Speak up, man!' "'Heliograph message from Sir Charles Warren,' shouted Saul. "'You have been promoted general. You are in command of the peak.' 
and then, with a dusty, sweat-streaked grin, he added, Well done, sir. Aitchison stared at him aghast. Oh, what about General Woodgate? He was shot through the head two hours ago. I didn't know. Since morning, Aitchison had known nothing that was happening outside his own small section of the line. His whole existence had closed down to a hundred yards of shrapnel and bullet-swept earth. Now he peered out at the holocaust around him and whispered, In command! <laughs> no one commands here. The devil is directing this battle. Sir Charles is sending up three more battalions to reinforce us, Saul shouted into his ear. We can well use them, Aitchison grunted. And then, Friedman, I've sprained my ankle. I want you to lace up my boot as tight as you can. I'm going to need this foot again before the day is out. Saul knelt without argument and began working over his foot. One of the riflemen at the parapet beside him was thrown sideways. He fell across Aitchison's lap, and from the wound in his temple the contents of his skull splattered them both. With an exclamation of surprise and disgust, Saul pulled back and wiped his face. Then he reached forward to drag the body from Aitchison's legs. Leave him, Aitchison prevented him sharply. See to that boot. While Saul obeyed, Aitchison unwound the silk scarf from around his own neck and covered the mutilated head. It was a wound he had seen repeated a hundred times that day. All of them shot through the right side of the head. Allo Knoll, he whispered fiercely. If only we had taken Allo Knoll. Then his tone dulled. My poor lads. And gently he eased the shattered head from his lap. Chapter 30 They are ripe now. Let us pluck them. With five hundred of his burghers, young Polus had left the shelter of Allo Knoll and worked his way forward, crawling belly down through the jumble of rocks, until now they were crouched in a line along a fold of dead ground below the false crest. Twenty yards ahead of them was the right-hand extremity of the English trench. They could not see it, but clearly they heard the incoherent cries of the wounded, the shouts of, Stretcher-bearer! Stretcher-bearer! And ammunition boys! Here! And above the splutter of musketry, the continuous metallic rattle of breech bolts reloading. You must signal to the guns, Umpol, the burger next to him reminded him. They are. Jan Polus removed the Homburg from his head and waved with it at the fat mound at Allo Knoll behind them. He saw his signal briefly acknowledged and knew that the order to cease fire was being flashed by heliograph to the batteries. They waited, tensed to charge, a long line of men. Jan Polus glanced along them and saw that each man stared fixedly ahead most of their faces masked by beards of fifty different hues, but here and there a lad too young for this work, too young to hide his fear. Thank God my eldest is not yet twelve, or he would be here. He stopped that train of thought guiltily, and concentrated his whole attention on the volume of shell-fire that raged just ahead of them. Abruptly it ceased, and in the comparative silence the rifle-fire sounded strangely subdued. Jan Polus let the slow seconds pass, counting silently to ten, before he filled his lungs and roared, Freestart! Come on, the free staters! Echoing his cry, yelling wildly, his burghers surged forward over the crest onto the English flank. They came from so close in, seeming to appear as a solid wall from under the English parapet, that the momentum of their charge carried them instantly into the depleted line of shell-shocked, thirst-tormented and dazed Lancashires. Hardly a shot was fired, and though a few individual scuffles rippled the smooth onward flow of the charge, most of the English responded immediately to the shouts of Hands up! Hands up! by throwing down their rifles and climbing wearily to their feet with hands held high. They were surrounded by jubilant burghers and hustled over the parapet and down the slope towards Allo Knoll. A great milling throng of burghers and soldiers spread over fifty yards of the trench. Quickly, Jan Polis shouted above the hubbub. Catch them and take them away. He was well aware that this was only a very localised victory, involving perhaps a tenth of the enemy. Already cries of, The Lanks are giving in! Where are the officers? Back, you men! were spreading along the English line. He had planted the germ of defeat among them. Now he must spread it through them before he could carry the entire position. Frantically he signalled for reinforcements 
from the Boer positions along the crest. Hundreds of his burghers were already running forward from Alonno. Another five minutes and complete victory would emerge from the confusion. Damn you, sir! What do you think you're doing? The voice behind him was impregnated with authority, unmistakably that of a high-ranking officer. Jan Polus wheeled to face a tall and enraged old gentleman, whose pointed grey whiskers quivered with fury. The apoplectic crimson of his countenance clashed horribly with its coating of red dust. I am taking your men hands up away, Jan Polus struggled gutturally with the foreign words. I'll be damned if you are, sir. Leaning heavily on the shoulder of a skinny little dark-haired man who supported him, the officer reached forward and shook a finger in Jan Polus's face. There will be no surrender on this hill. Kindly remove your rabble from my trench. Rabble, is it? roared Jan Polus. Around them the Boers and the British had ceased all activity, and were watching with interest. Jan Polus turned to the nearest burghers. Fatalavech! Take them away! His gesture that accompanied the order was unmistakable. We'll have none of that, sir, Aitchison glared at him before issuing his own orders. You men, fall back and reform on the Devonshires. Hurry it up now, come along, come along. Hey, Jan Polus held up his hand. These are my... He groped for the word. My, these are my, my captures. Sir, Aitchison released his grip on Saul's shoulder, drew himself up to his full height, and glared up into Jan Polus's face. I will give you five minutes to vacate this trench. Otherwise, you will become my prisoner. Good day to you. And he hobbled away through the grass. Jan Polus stared in disbelief. When fifty paces away, Aitchison turned, folded his arms across his chest, and waited grimly for the expiry of the five minutes. About him, he had gathered a handful of battle-stained soldiers, and it was clearly his intention to implement his threat with this pitiful little band. Jan Polus wanted to laugh with frustration the skinny old goat. But he realised with dismay that most of his prisoners were filtering away and hurrying to join Aitchison. He must do something, but what? The whole position was deteriorating into a farce. Stop them, he shouted at his burghers. Hold those men, they went hands up. They cannot change their minds now. Then abruptly the whole position altered. Over the skyline behind Aitchison and his tiny party poured a solid phalanx of fresh khaki-clad figures. The three battalions of reinforcements sent up from the foot of the mountain by Sir Charles Warren had at last arrived. Aitchison glanced over his shoulder and saw them swarming forward. The brown parchment of his face tore laterally in a wide and wicked grin. Fix bayonets, he shrieked and drew his sword. Buglers, sound the charge. Charge, men, charge. Hopping and stumbling like a stork with a broken leg, he led them. Behind him, the glittering crest of a wave, a line of bayonets raced down on the trench. Jan Polus's burghers hated naked steel. There were five hundred of them against two thousand. They broke and blew away like smoke on a high wind. Their prisoners ran with them. Jan Polus reached the crest and dropped behind a boulder that already sheltered three men. Stop them! Here they come! he panted while the British wave slowed and expended itself against the reef of hidden mouses, while they fell back with the shrapnel scourging them once more. Jan Polus knew that he would not stand in the British trench again that day. He could sense the despondency among his burghers. He knew that already the faint-hearted were slipping away to where their ponies waited at the foot of the mountain. He knew with sickened acceptance that he had lost Spion Cop. Oh, the English had paid a heavy price, all right. There must be fifteen hundred of their dead and wounded strewn upon the peak. But they had torn a gap in his line. He had lost Spion Cop, and through this breach would pour twenty-five thousand men to relieve Ladysmith, and to drive his burghers out of Natal and into the Transvaal. They had lost. It was finished. John Aitchison tried desperately to ignore the agony of his bloated foot. He tried to shut out the shrill chorus of the wounded pleading for water. There was no water on the peak. He turned his gaze away from the trench, where men, drugged with exhaustion, oblivious to the thunder of the bombardment that still raged about them, lay in sleep upon the bodies of their dead and dying companions. He looked instead at the sun, that great bloody orb, lightly screened with long streamers of cloud. In an hour it would be dark, and he knew he had lost. The message he held in his hands admitted it. 
The grotesque piles of dead men that clogged the trench proved it. He reread the message with difficulty, for his vision jerked and swam giddily. If you cannot hold until tomorrow, retire at your discretion. Buller. Tomorrow. What would tomorrow bring, if not a repetition of today's horror? They had lost. They were going down from this mountain. They had lost. He closed his eyes and leaned back against the rough stone of the parapet. A nerve in his eyelid began to twitch insistently. He could not stop it. <laughs>